Hi, my name is John Garfield. Uh, I want to talk to you about the number eight and new beginnings. Uh, eight years ago, we found out an investment that I made, not Sue and I, just I, <laughs> it was a Ponzi scheme. And uh, although we had been in it four or five years it, and it did great, it eventually uh, went south and we nearly went bankrupt. And we didn't just lose the money, um, we lost everything but our house. We thought we were going to lose that. And then we had a legal liability that went with it that dragged on for the whole eight years. And this week we got an email from a lawyer with, with these words, I'm pleased to send you the attached order of dismissal. This is over. Um, so I forwarded it to several friends through tears that helped me through the depression. And it, uh, life during that long season was putting one foot in front of another with a sort of an intellectual sense that of all the lost opportunities, you know, like there's no retirement, had to go back to work. Um, and at the same time, the hard experience of resurrection into new dimensions of the kingdom. So we wrote uh, Seers and Doers during that period. And more recently, um, th th an another uh, book on kingdom. So this new beginnings on the number eight, um, later that day, after I sent the email to friends, the Lord spoke to me about the number eight. And it's the number of new beginnings. Uh, in the biblical sense, the number eight means that you will start a new phase in your life. According to the Bible, it's a, the, the eight is the symbol of new beginnings. So the Lord also spoke to me that it was not just about me, that the nation is on the threshold of new beginnings. And it's going to touch the nation's plural in the sense of reformation. So it's a new beginning. Uh, it, but it's also the dawning of a new day, Isaiah 60, with new wine, Luke 5:38, and new mindsets, Romans 12:2. Old things are passing away, and the new is here. It's in 2 Corinthians 5:17. So then he took me to this passage in Luke chapter 9, which starts in verse 23. He said, and he, he said to all of them, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whatever, whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. And then it goes on, and so that was our experience. Um, so I'm going to come back to that. But uh, then the very next verse, verse 28, says about eight days. And that caught my eye. <laughs> about eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as flashing lightning. lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, and, when, and referring to the cross and the resurrection. And that word departure in the Greek is exodus. I was amazed. So Jesus had this exodus from life on earth to bring the kingdom in the same way that Moses brought people out of Egypt into the new land. Um, Luke uh, 9.37 says, The next day when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met them. And uh, in verse 42, um, Jesus, uh, the, the man with the um, demon-possessed son, that whose the disciples couldn't you know, fix, <laughs> and brought him to Jesus, and um, Jesus rebuked the evil spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were amazed at the greatness of God, the goodness of God. So Jesus walked me through the progression of my own experience in those verses. So the cross is the place of resurrection. Usually we think of dying to self and all that. Well, I am resurrecting to the desires that God wrote in my heart. <laughs> this is not some, you know wretched experience. It's a glorious experience to take up your cross and follow him. And that's exactly where it leads to a place of resurrection. So new days come after dark nights. There's always uh, walking out the way of the cross and, and losing my own life and gaining his. I mean, it didn't go the way I expected it to. It went a better way. The, a loving father put me in a confusing wilderness so he could speak clear to me clearly to me, and, and Jesus described his own glorification somewhat similar 
in uh, John 12, 23. It says, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies. It remains only a single seed, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. And that's the experience. And, and, and right after that, he says, uh, the man who loves his life will lose it. And the man who will hate his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant will be also. My father will honor the one who serves me. And I, I um, just thought that was, uh, you know, profound that, we as believers go through this process where we fall to the ground, fall on our face, <laughs> and and then uh, the seed germinates and, and we rise again to something much better. And that process is something that the, that the Lord does for all of us. So the second thing is eight days after Jesus talked uh, about the first thing, number one, he took Peter, James, John and James with him and went up into a mountain to pray. So that's a picture of Mount Zion or the Divine Council. So the resurrection takes us somewhere. Uh, as sons, we're invited into the Father's Council and we wrote seers and doers to describe that experience. Jesus, Moses, and Elijah discussed the Exodus. And just like the Jewish Exodus from Egypt, Jesus led believers from the Old Covenant into the Kingdom. That's exactly what sons do. That's exactly why we experience uh, death and, and resurrection. So that message flows out of us like a river. Third one, opportunity. Uh, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd was waiting for them. <laughs> when we're broken before God, number one, number two, present in his council. Number three, we bring, bring back something from heaven to earth that people are hungry for. Um, that's where crowds gather. Although courageous, we're not really in the business of promoting ourselves the Father promotes His sons and makes their name great when we put the kingdom first. And that comes sort of after that breaking process. So divine appointments and open doors that no man can shut become the norm when, when we get on the page of doing what our Father's doing. Um, number four, signs and wonders follow. This trademark for new beginnings in the kingdom is the power and authority the Father invests in sons. We're not servants feeling lost and abandoned. We're not, nobody's dropped us to the ground. Um, we're, we are sons who co-labor with the Father. Um, when we have the exciting privilege of doing the works and even greater works. So I fell, but I fell right into the Father's arms, right into uh, his purpose for my life. The Mark 16, 20 says, Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them, and can confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. He, Hebrews 2 verse 2, God also testifying with them both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So just when we thought COVID-19 would destroy the world's economies and all the clamor about injustice would divide our nation, we're seeing that those two things are really diversions from the enemy that distract us from what the Father is really doing. Reformation is in the wings, and it's a season to ce celebrate it and contend for it. It's a season of new beginnings. For me personally, I want to suggest it's an, a season for you, and it's a season for the nations. So Isaiah 60, starting in verse 1, Arise, shine, for your light has come. Uh, the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness uh, of your dawn. Uh, Reformation is in the wings. It's, and it's a season to, it, it's not inappropriate to celebrate it. <laughs> That's what I want to tell you. I mean, the, the economy, the last three months has been in the toilet. Um, the stock market has come back in an amazing way, and uh, all the, the uh, you know, the police shootings and all the turmoil, the burning buildings, all that that's caused. I want to suggest that uh, those are distractions. Uh, We've got to fix a few things, but the primary thing that's happening behind the scenes is that our Father is restoring the book of a nation. He's restoring my book. He's restoring your book. 
and he's bringing reformation to nations. And he's inviting, and it's a season. It's, this week is a season you can start celebrating the, the victory that God has in mind for his people. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm releasing books uh, in the, from the lives of people all the way to nations. And I'm paving the way in the Spirit for a reformation. And, Father, we're dancing before you. We see uh, the host in heaven, the applause of heaven over a great nation. Father, it's President Trump's birthday today. And, Father, we thank you for him. We thank you for uh, exposing the deep state and giving us the opportunity to set captives free around the world. <clears throat> Father, we're so grateful for um, just a healthy economy and, uh, Father, uh, a healthy nation. And, Father, we celebrate your goodness in our lives and in our nations. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Have a great week.